Since 2015, PF Blocker has been protecting assets behind consumer and corporate networks of PFSense open source firewall. So PF Blocker, I've talked about it a couple times before. I want to talk about the latest version. I talked about it about a year ago that they were developing the 2.2 series, and uh, they've really you know, come a long ways. The It seems very stable. I've been using it. We have it on our production machines here. And so I figured I'd talk about it and go over how to configure and set it up. A couple things I want to get out of the way. First, please donate to them if you can spare a few dollars. It always helps these developers of these open source projects. And you can see currently I am a $10 a month developer on this and maybe I should up it a little more. Uh, but I want to raise awareness of the project and raise awareness that, you know, open source, the, the code is free, but the time that these people spend on it is valuable. Therefore, uh, show your appreciation by helping them out. Further reading. There is a forum where you want to dive deep and discuss with the PF Blocker developer and other people using it and, you know, find details of uh, questions or is it possible to configure questions that is discussed right here under Reddit slash R slash PF Blocker NG. So there's a pretty active discussion group. You can see there's a lot of posts in here and uh, it it's very helpful. You know, if you have questions or uh, are want to interact with the development team right here is where you can post some of those and dive deeper into it. Now, I am running, uh, I've run in the past via the PF Blocker 2.1 series. I've tried the 2.2 at the time I tried it over a year ago. It was, it was pretty good, but I don't think it was really there. Uh, as of right now, it seems to be quite stable. I haven't had any problems with it and it works great. Now, if you already have PF Blocker 2.1 installed and you want to move to PF Blocker 2.2, it should keep all the settings. But as I always say, backup, 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 uh, just in case it goofs up or you need to rerun something on there and make sure you understand the settings. The concept I'm doing from here with our lab server is I'm going to be loading it fresh and that way it's not pulling in any legacy settings. And that way, if you're a new user to PFSense, this will be the getting started with a 2.25 version of PF Blocker. So first things first, we click the install and then we click confirm and it downloads it. So this part's really straightforward and simple. How fast to install will vary greatly with the speed of your computer, but now it's installed. Now PF Blocker, which you're gonna go over here and it's gonna bring us to the wizard to get it set up. Couple quick, items. A lot of people ask this, what if I'm running a Windows domain, will PF Blocker work? Well, PF Blocker has two pieces to it. One does IP blocking based on firewall rules. One does DNS sinkhole. So if you're running a Windows Active Directory network, the DNS server generally is set to be that Windows Active Directory server to have the least amount of problems with Active Directory. But you can upstream from that, tell the Windows server to talk to the PF Blocker on PF Sense and use PF Sense for DNS resolution. So the computers will then go to the AD server and the AD server then can use this. That will work for the DNS blocking. The firewall blocking rules that block IP addresses based on firewall rules because that is just IP blocking, no problem. That works whether it's on a Windows domain or not. So it depends on which piece of PF Blocker you're speaking to. But if you're doing it as a, I want to get to this IP address, but then it is sinkholed or blocked inside of PF Blocker with a firewall rule, it's going to work whether you have Windows uh, or not. But when you're running a Windows Active Directory server and using DNS, it will first try to resolve those addresses inside of Windows. And then Windows will then reach out with the Windows server will reach out to there. So DNS sinkholing, or as people like to say, like, you know, blocking of some of the tracking sites, that is uh, only if the DNS in within your realm of network is set to this. And it uh, works with the DNS inside of PFSense. So we're going to head and hit next on the wizard. Hopefully it answers the questions on there. The PF Blocker Wizard will configure a default setup for PF Blocker NG. All the settings will be wiped if you don't need any, any previous installs. Uh, IP firewalls will be added to select outbound interfaces to block the worst offenders. Uh, DNS BL utilizing DNS Resolver adverts to the worst known malicious domains will be blocked. So this is basically what it's doing. You select the Inbound, as in what's the external? Maybe you have more than one WAN address because you have dual providers. You would select all of the inbound external ones and then all of your internal interface. Just hold the control key and press there. So we have LAN and LAN2. Not creatively named in my lab, I know. VIP address, the virtual IP address. This is just make sure you don't have this network in use on your current system. So if you have this IP, the 10.10.10.1, if that is something you're already using, you're like, hey, I use that IP, don't. Uh, 
then change it. So you just change it here. I'm not using this one, so it's fine, but just a word to the wise when I've seen people who have struggled with problems, they coincidentally through a series of, well, just unfortunate um, <laughs> alignments of events here have had that as their root IP of their PF sense and because they change it to 10, 10, 10 because it seemed fun. That is the VIP address for this. But you can choose whatever you want here. I'm going to leave it at default because I don't have that network. And then port 8081, 8443, make sure they're not in use um, on there. Uh, local port upon which the DNS of a web server will protection, the default is 8443. This can be left default unless different port needs to be used. When you change it here, it changes it all the other places. So I like that the wizard can do that for you. Make it simple. And that's it. Finish. It's set up. Magic. Takes a second here. And it's set up, but the first thing it has to do is get those lists of where those bad reputation IPs are. So it's going to download Easy Privacy, Attaway, and a lot of other lists. So I'll let it finish this real quick. Update process ended and completed. So here we go. Total table entries, uh, blah, blah, blah. You can read, scroll back through all the details, but basically it's all configured and successfully updated. So just seeing if there's any errors or doesn't seem to be any update process ended. I don't see any major problems. So the wizard is now finalized and a, it says a message has been saved to the wizard log. So if we need to see that, let's go all the way to the beginning here and run through what it has here. Now, right here is PF blockers enabled, keep settings. And this is the common settings for a lot of the plugins. That way, if you ever have to remove it, it has the options to um, whether or not you want these settings in here. Uh, it will remove them or wipe them. So that's pretty pretty straightforward there. Uh, cron settings default every hour this updates. Uh, down limit threshold, no limit. Um, if you need to adjust any of these, these are in case you want a little more or some type of like, hey, only try this many times or how big you want the logs. We're going to leave it all at default for now, but you kind of get the idea. If you need or want more logs and have the space for it, you can adjust all that here. Uh, same thing with all the cron settings. You can change it from every hour, two hours, three hours, whatever works for you. Here is where the IP reputation part starts. So here's the IP settings and uh, placeholder IP address, ASN, et cetera, et cetera. Whether or not we want to reject or have it uh, block on, by default, we want it to block on the WAN and reject here. Uh, reject versus block, if you're not familiar with what the two rules do. So when it blocks, it gives no notice. It just drops and goes away. You don't even know you're, you don't get any notice at all. Rejection, well, it tells you, no, you're not allowed to go here. And you want reject on the internal ones. That way there's actually some type of answer back. But from the external side, if someone's trying to get in, blocking works better because you don't even want to waste your time sending back a notice at all to the person that they're blocked. Just let it go away. And this is for the IP rules. Now, the other thing I'm going to change here from default is I like it to be floating rules. And let me show you why. So we're going over here to firewall rules. And you'll see here's a rule under LAN and LAN2. And there's two different schools of thought here. If you do them under floating, you can see the rules all in one place. If you do them and for however many networks you create, it will have a rule under each one of these, uh, you can then see where the things are coming from. So it all depends on how you want to consolidate things. If you want to consolidate it under a floating rule, um, that's where this checkbox does this. And I kind of like it that way. So it's, everything's in a floating rule. But if you want it granular based on each network, um, you can put them under each network, which is where they end up by default. But Remember, when we start customizing or adding a bunch of things in here, those rules start repeating throughout all the networks. So uh, just something to consider and think about when you're doing it as opposed to, I just want them blocked and we go here and hit uh, save IP settings. Now that'll move to floating rule. By the way, it won't automatically move to floating rule. It won't do that until we go over here to update. We'll just reload things real quick. We'll hit run. Now we didn't do a download. We just reloaded it. And it's going to grab everything again and reprocess, reload task force all, update process ended. All right. And now the floating rule is here and there's not a rule under each one of these. So that's how that works in case you didn't know. Uh, for every time you make a change, it would have done it automatically on the hour, but we can just go to the reload option and reload either just the IP or the DNS or BL side and run it again. Back over to the IPs. So now we've moved it over to a floating rule. Keep it pretty simple. 
Um, it lets you customize how the rules work. And oh, I didn't save this, but I'll turn it on now. Kill states. When enabled, after a cron vent force commands, any blocked IPs found in the firewall states will be cleared. Why do I do that? Well, what happens is, let's say you have a connection to some scary command and control server from inside your network to said server. Well, that server was not known to be a command and control server, and then an IP gets added to the list on one of those hourly updates. When you change a firewall rule, and this is uh, the way PFSense work, it may not ki it will change the rule, but it won't block states of that rule running already. So I block a port or I block an IP address, but there's already an established TCP connection. Until that connection gets reestablished, which it wouldn't because if there's a rule to stop it or that IP is in a block list, then it wouldn't, but it, the established state won't go away. By saying kill states, if a IP address pops up in there, if there's any computers that, with established connections, it will break those connections because it'll reset any connections that match that rule. So just something to think about when you're uh, doing that. GeoIP. This is where you have to decide how you want to handle, uh, for example, the top spammers in the GeoIP. So we're going to go ahead and we can say deny inbound, deny outbound, deny both. Now, there's a few more options here. I'm not going to get into the details for specific, specific use cases. But if you go deny both, and we're going to go ahead and edit this rule a little bit more detailed here. If you go to denying both, that means no system can make an outbound connection to those. Now that may work fine for the top spammers, which by the way, you can hold the control key, click which ones, or hit control A and just grab them all. And then we'll modify because we didn't hit save at the top here. Deny outbound, or actually we'll go ahead and deny both on spammers. I think we're okay with this one. Then we'll hit save. And now we go back over here and we look at the GOIP. It's enabled and it says deny both here. And then let's go ahead and deny inbound from places we don't need. So we'll go and deny inbound for this one, but not outbound. And the reason why is, and this only really matters for inbound if you're hosting things, you have ports open on your firewall. So in our production environment, even specifically for my office, for example, we do have ports open for things we host. I don't need anyone connecting from this particular country or let's say Antarctica. And we'll say list action, I don't need inbound. Asia, yeah, well, same thing, we'll deny inbound again. Europe, deny inbound. Now, if I were to deny outbound as well, for example, in Europe, that's when I would start having a real problem. And what do I mean by that? Well, I wouldn't be able to go to a European website, so I would actually be blocking my ability to talk to those. And you don't realize maybe just how many sites may be hosted over in Europe. And you know, obviously, if you're in Europe, you do. But um, I've seen people where they've set these up and start breaking things right away by denying your ability to get there. Some servers, some companies you may buy services from are hosted over in Germany. They're hosted over in some place in Europe. And if you deny the firewall's ability to outbound those. Now, inbound, this only matters if you have ports open because by default, the WAN interface on PFSense and a lot of home users, if you're opening no ports, this is your default rule is deny everything. So it doesn't matter if you have this or not, you're wasting time doing it because if you have no ports open, well, it doesn't matter. Now I do like denying all these for our inbound because like I said, we do have hosting open. So you just have to think about the use cases uh, when you're doing that. Same with, you know, de deny all these weird proxy and satellite ones. We'll go ahead and deny those too which is a long list, so page, page, page. <laughs> so I'm just hitting control A to get those and deny inbound. And now we have all the different ones. Hey, let's do South America, why not? And like I said, you can see that this is granular, so you can filter and find these. Now, once you've done all this, once again, you could wait an hour or we can go back over here and we'll just go ahead and reload just the IP side of it. And it's gonna update all those rules. That's done there. Now let's back over here and look at the firewall rules. And now you can see here's all the different blocks. It creates an alias list for each one of them. Now, this is also why I mentioned running floating rules. As you can see, now I have this list of rules here in floating, but these are still nice and clean. These would then end up repeating in each one of the networks if you didn't do it as a floating rule. So just some thoughts on that, like I said, for kind of my reasoning for why we do it. So source, and it's got these blocked, and then these ones as destinations are blocked. So here we go, that's kind of the basic for the GOIP blocking, which is important. 
Now let's talk about the DNSBL side of this. So this is where you DNS sinkhole. This is name resolution versus the other stuff is IP level blocking. And the default feeds it has is uh, easy feeds utilizing domains blocked, the uh, collection of advertisement domain feeds and collection of malicious domain feeds. This is where you can also add more custom ones if you have some particular list you want, things like that. So these are some predefined ones that are pretty basic, but it shows where they're pulling from. You can follow this format if you know another one and there's other companies or other groups, I should say, not really businesses, but they have these uh, lists and this is where you can update or change these lists and be able to put like a specific list of things that you don't want, you want resolved there. And what these lists, if you want to ever see what's inside of them, they're pretty easy. They're just basic text files. So you can actually see it's blocking whatever this is, whatever these domains are. These are lists that these people maintain. Uh, and this is a malware domain list. So anything that tries to get there, it's uh, yeah some crappy website that these people have sinkhole. But you have to be careful because maybe these lists have false positives in them. That is a risk you're going to get with any of these lists. So uh, take them for what they will. And I've seen people debate and argue about who has the best list. That's beyond the scope of this, but kind of gets you an idea of what these look like. Like here's a ransom tracking list. And these are sites for, I'm assuming a bunch of, yeah. And they look pretty crappy to me because I, if you're connecting to that site, you probably have a problem on your network uh, on there for sure. So probably this list looks pretty valid to me, but hey. Uh, they also have some category options if you want to try using the categories and they're pulled from uh, these blacklists to enable and lets you do a little bit more filtering. I've not done much testing with this, but uh, these try to group things into categories based on that. Now, this is where they've done a great job and where these feeds are, because you're seeing all those really, where is all this coming from? Where's this data? Well, they actually started filling them out in here and they made it a lot easier to add a list. So this is just the wizard and the default ones that they have on here. And they do have some warnings of don't just click everything, do not enable all the feeds because, well, you're going to break stuff. Um, it, it'll be maybe more than your PFSense can handle. But we have some nice ones like Talos Snort, heard of Snort. I've talked a lot about Snort and uh, threat list from them, the Talos Security Group. They've got a great blog, by the way. You can then, they're in here by default as one of the lists. Now, all you have to do to add something to list, let's go in here and let's say, uh, well, here's the developer. He has his own list. And I think Tor is in the list. Let's find that. Uh, Blacklist DE, Tor, My APs, Spam House. Add away, abuse tracker. Oh, malware bytes. So this is actually malware bytes has host in here. And this is actually kind of cool too. So when you click on these links here, they take you to some of the websites where these are. So you can read more about what these rule sets are that you're adding in here. So if we wanted to add that in there, uh, malware domains, ransom tracker, where was it at again? We just go ahead and hit the uh, plus. All right, save. And now we have that one in there and we just say unbound once a day, save, hit okay. Now it's gonna pull that list in there as well. So it's kind of cool It's that the way they did these feeds, so you can figure out what feeds you want, what ones you want to add in there. And I believe Tor is in here somewhere if you wanted to block some of the uh, Tor sites as well. But you kind of get the idea for a lot of feed options in here. And I thought this was cool too. They even have like the Alien Vault list. So if we're going to click plus on the Alien Vault list, and it's an IP reputation list, not a DNS one. So we're going to hit save. And we'll uh, go ahead and deny inbound from them. Save, hit OK. Yeah, deny inbound every hour. And once again, they give a lot of fine tuning options if you want to do a couple uh, specific things like only custom destination ports and block and things like that. But once you've done this, we're going to go back over here to the update. Go to reload and we'll just reload both real quick. Okay, update process ended. And we get back over here to our firewall rules. And we see all the rules are up to date. And here's, you know, all the things we blocked and et cetera, et cetera. Now, quick behind the scenes, you know, if you're not familiar with the aliases, I think I've done a video specifically on how the aliases work in uh, PFSense. But you go here to the aliases and you can see how PF Blocker pulls these. So if you see it's pulling from 
HTTPS and is pulling from localhost 555 PF blocker. It runs its own internal web server. So when it updates and pulls these aliases, it actually pulls from a file it creates and then pushes a web server back to uh, so it can pull and update the alias every time it runs one of those updates. Just a little behind the scenes um, of what's going on when it creates these. It doesn't have to, it, I kind of like the fact that it's not doing anything magic. It's exposed through the UI, so to speak, how it's doing it. But when they say do not edit this alias, do not edit the alias or you'll cause unexpected behavior in PF Blocker. Now, PF Blocker itself is fun to have up and running, but I also spun up a box over here, a, a Windows machine. And I haven't done anything but boot it up and I wanted to show you what the reports look like. Because obviously there's not going to be a lot in these reports and there's not many alerts when there's no... Uh, nothing behind it. And this is our lab server. So the only thing behind it is one Windows box with this particular IP address, 192.168.4120. And I like that just by starting it up, the first thing it did was reach out and go settings.win.data.microsoft, which is the Microsoft tracking. By the way, this is another feature. I really like the way they have this built into PF Blocker. So here's our the fact that it was uh, blocked. And right here, we can do threat lookup. So we're going to go ahead and open it in a new tab and we can look up that threat. So what is, and you notice that reputation lookup, uh, search string is settings.windata.microsoft, and it gives you what that information is. It's actually a trusted website. Whether or not you trust Microsoft, at least it's trusted as in it's not doing anything malicious, it's just telemetry data uh, coming from Microsoft, or going to Microsoft, I should say, and it got sync hold. They give you a few different places you can look things up. And this is kind of cool because you can see how it's pushing this setting to here. And then each one of these, it's then taking you to their website and seeing if it's in their list. Like this one's not in the list here, but you kind of get the idea. But if we want to whitelist it, let's say we want to send telemetry data to Microsoft. That's pretty easy too. You click the little plus button. And it says whitelist settings when data Microsoft. Note this will immediately remove the block domain and associated C names from DNSBL and whitelisting options. So we're going to hit OK. And then right here, I don't, it funny because it's in yellow here. Do you wish to wildcard whitelist? And that means anything dot settings at Microsoft as opposed to just settings. And we're just going to whitelist this, but in case you want to do a series of potential prefixes that are in front of it, that would wildcard it. So we're just going to whitelist this in general. And it says, uh, do you want to add a description? Yep. MS telemetry. I think that's how you spell telemetry. And now we've whitelisted this. And when it does the reload, it will uh, be in here now. So you may need to flush your browser cache. Yeah, and this is one thing too. Once it's been sync sometimes it may get stuck in the browser uh, for doing it. And if we wanted to undo it real quickly, we could go right here and trash that. So there is options to go back and you know fix it if you need to. Now, if you wanted to go back and see that whitelist later, not just in the alerts, you go over here to DNSPL. I'll scroll down here, DNSPL whitelist, and you can see somewhere within here, hey, look, there it is for MS telemetry. So there is where you can edit the whitelist from the raw, so to speak, and uh, no regex allowed. This is let you, you know, put things in here for the whitelisting, so you can do custom here. All right, now let's see what happens when we open up a browser. Because like I said, the report looks kind of boring. So let's open up the browser real quick. Let's see what happens when we go to some news site, for example. All right, we go to news.google.com. Surely that will take us somewhere. Horse launches into New Jersey building second floor. Well, that's a sad story. Why do I have to pick that one? But I bet there was some ad tracking that just occurred. <laughs> that's what really that was important about. So let's go ahead and... Update this. Oh man, look at all the things that just tried to pop up right there. So here's just by opening up uh, news at Google and then that other one link we clicked, we can see right away there's a lot going on here. And then we can dive over here to the uh, stats and see, oh man, look at all the things, the CDNs and the bat bing and all the stuff that got tracked on there. So you can see pretty quickly this alerts will fill up. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover is because the question comes up of, you know, do I need to build a really fast, beefy machine to run this? Or, you know, will my network uh, choke if I don't have a super fast, you know, uh, Epic or AMD Threadripper on my PFSense here or some, you know, Xeon with 64 gigs of RAM? Is this thing a system hog? No, that's the last thing I want to cover here is my own PFSense. So I'm going to go ahead and drag it over here. So here's my system, an SG-1100. And uh, 
you can see that, you know, I'm running the latest release here and I'm using all of 24% of my memory to run this. And it's got PF Blocker installed, so let's actually show you what happens when you run it at home. Obviously this, <laughs> you can see I do have some things open on my uh, home, uh, home system. And yeah, we've got some blocking going on here. Well, plenty of things uh, being stopped and things that has deemed malicious and stuff like that. So let's go over here and actually look at the stats. And I may have to blur some things out here, but let's look at the reports. And we'll go over here to the uh, stats page here. Well, DNSPL stats. And between my kids and my wife using Instagram, we see that, well, graphs and Instagram, some of that tracking's been blocked. Uh, some of the other stuff's been blocked. So we're... Ever all this is, I have no data at flurry.com, settings, win data. Oh, look, Windows machines calling out because uh, the gaming system's win, uh, running Windows. But you get the idea. So it works perfectly fine, even on SG1100. Uh, they seem to have done a lot of coding to make this a very efficient project. And I haven't really had any issues at all running my SG1100 at home. Um, this is one of the reasons I've talked about recommending the SG1100. Like, this is a lot of times what people want to do. And for a pretty inexpensive box. It uh, doesn't seem to have any problems handling it. I don't have any problems playing any games, but occasionally, and you're going to run into some of the games, you may run into things you have to whitelist to not break things because they may require some of the servers that were on the blacklist. So some fine tuning and using that little uh, going through the alerts and whitelisting things as needed may be necessary. Uh, but hopefully this gives you a good idea of the whole PF blocker system. And as I said at the beginning, if you can contribute and donate to the project, that'd be great. Uh, it's a wonderful tool, uh, definitely a good add-on to PFSense, one of my favorites uh, for being able to, you know, block things coming inbound and block certain things going outbound that you may not want or sinkholing things via DNS. So uh, if you want to dive deeper, have some developer questions and things like that, head over to their uh, Reddit. You can also participate in the uh, PF Blocker NG forums over at the NetGate as well. Those are both very, uh, for the more deep and technical things. I mean, I cover a lot in my forums, but if you want to talk to the developer directly, uh, BBCAN177 is very active in those forums and does reply to a lot of it. So if you have suggestions or product update ideas, that would be the place to go and post that. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.